Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Today I'm going to share with you a very powerful truth. Three words. Just trust Him. Just trust Him. You may turn to your neighbor and say, just trust Him. I guarantee there will be situation in your life that you need to trust God. How do you know you trust God? Is there some sign or some fruits when you trust God or when you don't trust God? All right, many of us will definitely go to situation in life that at some point we truly need to trust God. Let's turn to the book of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 to 8. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 to 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which break out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf shall be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Wow, that's a strong word in verse 5. It says, Curse is the man who trusts in the man and lean on the arm of flesh. I'm sure some of us have been disappointed in our life because we put our trust in man. I know a personal friend many years ago, he, he had cancer and he trusted the doctor, he trusted the chemo, though against uh, advice of others, especially myself, that I wasn't think that the chemo would help him. In fact, he died faster and he exhausted all his savings just to have the chemotherapy and he died faster, he suffered so much and all his savings was gone. I was thinking if only he could just trust God completely completely. Anyhow, there will be situation in our life that we need to trust God. I'm sure you've been cheated by men, close friends, you know, betrayal and etc. And we all learn. But God exhort us today to trust Him. All right, what happened when you trust Him? Number one, you'll not be anxious in the year of drought. In the time of drought, in the time of difficulty, dryness, economic recession, pandemic. All right, you do not be anxious. Are you anxious today? If you're anxious today, your word today means that you have not fully trust God. And then it says, you shall not fear when the heat comes. Second thing is fear. I think these two things plague humanity, fear and anxiety. And the reason we are fearful, we cannot sleep at night, and we have so many issues, because we don't trust God enough. And thirdly, when you trust God, you shall be like a tree that is planted and you will bear fruit and there will be a constant bearing fruit in your life. You have good fruits in your life. You know, two things that plague humanity about the anxiety and fear. Everywhere you go, if you give an altar call for people who are anxious, who are, uh, are fearful, I'm sure half of the church will come up. Why? Why do we go through anxiety, fear, when we go through problem, when we go through impossible case? because we don't truly trust God. I, I've been a Christian for, for more than 42 years. I learned something very basic. When you have a need, God has a provision. When you have a problem, God has a solution. When you have an impossible case, God has a miracle. So learn to trust Him. My son, he died in the mother's womb at nine weeks old. We trusted God. The, the, the medical report has to clean the womb and finish. And my, daughter, my, my wife was discharging black, decayed blood. And there was no heartbeat. But we trusted God. And God did a miracle, raised him back. So, basic Christianity. All right? Now, I want to share with you three situations in your life that you must trust God completely. The word trust means to abandon yourself, to surrender. Lord, I cannot do it. I surrender. Maybe your child is going through difficulty. Maybe you got an impossible situation that really crushed you. You know, just learn to trust Him. All right? Firstly, trust Him when you don't understand. Trust Him when you don't understand things that happen to you. 
All right, in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, Elimelech and his wife migrated to, to Moab in the times of famine. They were hoping for a better future. And the two sons, Malon and Kilon, went with them. And in the process of time, they married two daughter-in-law, Opa and Ruth. The Bible says in 10 years, all the three heads of the house died. The Bible did not give any reason in Ruth chapter 1. It was a horrible season of loss, pain, disappointment, and, and you know. So Naomi decided to immigrate back, go back to uh, Bethlehem. And she said to the people, my name is Naomi, means pleasant, but don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara, bitter. You see, this is a temptation, this is a difficulty when we go through difficult time of loss, disappointment, death, cheated, business bankrupt, lost our job. It's easy to become bitter. But I believe God allow, I use the word allow, and God is in control. Even the last two years of pandemic, we have lost some dear friends. We have, uh, uh, you know, the, the first one to die in Malaysia is uh, Pastor David Chang, who is our personal friend. We preach in his church many times. I had many meals with him when we were in Kuching. He even led worship uh, in our conference. But I, I feel sorry for the wife and the children who really missed him. You know, I understand it's difficult. We, we may not understand some things that happen. Do we become bitter or better? There's two words similar, bitter, better. The only difference is the I. I makes you bitter. When you begin to focus on I, me, and myself, everything is about yourself. You can become bitter. But be a better person. B-E-T-E. -E. The word E is Elohim. When your focus is on God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, I believe God will make something beautiful. Just, just trust Him because season will change. Bad season will not last. You will change. All right? Let me share with you one example of how sometimes things happen in our life that's beyond our control, beyond our imagination. Question is, do you too trust God? Or do you feel like Naomi? Call me bitter. We were ministering in a, in a, a, a place overseas somewhere. And this couple came up to us. It's a Chinese couple. And they were very broken and they have only one child, uh, one daughter, no other children. The wife, she was telling us the story, what happened. All her hopes and her dreams were on this particular daughter. And, and she grew up and she was raised in the church, goes to church and believe God, believe the word. One day she came back home and told her parent, I just married a Muslim man. Now, can you imagine as parents, you raise up your child, they all go to church, believe in Jesus. And now your daughter came back and told you, I have married a Muslim man. Not even uh, consult you, just inform you. The wife says, I, 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 my whole life was crushed. My dream was crushed. I even felt like committing suicide. Now, I, I can understand, you know, what we parents go through. I have a son. You know, when they go through difficult time, we also go through difficult time. But this was just beyond the couple. All that I said to him was, just trust God. I say, I don't understand. I don't have the solution as a preacher. And we don't pretend to have a solution. We also go through... Difficult times, troubled times, situation in our life that we don't understand. So we also as preachers need to trust God. So I told her, just trust God. I don't know how it's going to turn up. Just trust God. One year passed by, nothing happened. Two years passed by, something began to happen. I keep in touch with the parents and we WhatsApp. And I said, just pray for your son-in-law. If you reject him, you'll lose your daughter. So you've got to be very careful. All right? I know it's difficult. Why don't you just show her love, put the bridge, don't burn the bridge. If you reject your son-in-law, you will lose your daughter also. Just trust God. Just, I know it's hard to swallow. So they continue to pray, continue to believe God. One day, this son-in-law had an encounter with Jesus and he accepted the Lord. Do you know I had the honor to lay hands and pray for the daughter and the son-in-law? They came for our conference. Praise God. Now, we do not know what's going to happen, but our trust is in you. Season will change. Ruth and Naomi left Moab and went to Bethlehem. Guess what? 
it was ours. And that's where Ruth met Boaz and experienced new connection, new favor, new provision. So season will change. So get ready. Just trust God that good days are coming. Good news is coming. You have heard bad news the last three years. I want to speak to you today. Good news is coming. Proverbs 25, 25 says, just like a weary soul in a hot summer, a cold water to a weary soul in a hot summer. So is good news from afar. Wow, you know Malaysia is having heat wave right now. Wow, in the afternoon, imagine you walk in the hot sun or do some gardening and you come back with this cool, cold water. Wow, so refreshing. May I say to you, good news is coming. Your season will change. Just trust God 100%, right? Even though you don't seem to understand. So God can work out something powerful, something wonderful for your life. You know, in this pandemic, many people have lost their job, business. You know, the attendance in the church worldwide has dropped, offering has dropped, and so many things seem so negative. Question, is God is in charge? Is God is in control? Or God has lost his, his power? God is dethroned? Well, if God the Father is on the throne, even though we may not understand. I may not understand. Two years, so many months lockdown. Cannot go for so many things. Two years, you cannot travel overseas and etc, etc. But believe God, just trust God. Do you know during the peak of the pandemic in Malaysia, we can't even travel 10 kilometers out of where we are staying. We need to have a police report, police approval. Do you know during that time, God opened a supernatural door. My son graduated in America. And the mom was very excited to go, but I was not. So there are so many hurdles. Number one, you have to apply for immigration to approve us to go and attend our son's graduation. And we applied. I was hoping the immigration will say no. But praise God, I was surprised the immigration say yes. It's not a good reason to travel in the midst of pandemic, you know. And God opened the door. You know, we took a flight. Uh, Japan Airlines, it's about 300 old passengers, only 20 passengers in the plane. The Narita Airport was a ghost town, KLIA was a ghost town. Nobody travels, nobody dared to travel, but we did. So what I'm trying to say is, just trust God, even in impossible situation. Trust God in the worst of the worst. God will give you the breakthrough, God will see you through. Secondly, Trust God when the doors are closed. In life, we face open doors and closed doors. Doors are closed also mean a rejection, a, a, a no answer. Let's say you apply for a visa to, to go to America and the result came out, it was rejected. It was The door was closed for you to go to America, whether to study or holiday or, or whatever reason, you know. So what, what, what do you do? Do you still trust God or you say, ah, I don't trust God anymore? You see, you don't just trust God during good times. You don't just trust God because your son gets straight A's. You still trust God if your son gets straight F's. Does God have a plan for your son who gets straight F's, who fail an exam? You know, in life, it's not getting straight A's. I think it's just basically earning a living. So parents, just trust God and focus more important thing than straight A's for your children. You know, our whole life is centered about our children, tuition, more tuition. and <laughs> just, just for a point of reference, I have a mechanic friend here where I'm staying. He's just nearby here. And I think he earns so much more than my, my wife's nephew. My wife's nephew is a straight A student in SPM and everything. And, and he's a doctor, a medical doctor right now. And he's working for a Malaysian hospital. I, I roughly know his pay, I won't tell you, but I can assure you my mechanical friend, my mechanic friend who owns a shop, he has two workers and he's earning much more. And he's the boss. He wants to close, he close, he wants to sleep, he sleep, he wants to go for lunch, he goes for lunch, but not Krishna's nephew who is a doctor. He works like 12 hours, bomb out and not enough sleep, not enough rest and etc, etc. So what I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, just trust God. Whether you're a mechanic or a medical doctor, whether you're an engineer, you're even a janitor, janitor or a senator, we all have different grace and calling. Just trust God, even though the door 
is shut. All right, let me share with you a couple of examples. In the book of Genesis 40, we find Joseph. Joseph interpreted a cupbearer and the baker's dream, and he was in prison. Again, Joseph actually is a very good example of what we are talking about. He had a prophetic dream from God. He has a great destiny. The next thing, he was thrown in the pit, sold to Potiphar's house by his own brothers, met Mrs. Potiphar, falsely accused, landed in prison. I'm sure Joseph would say, hey, what's happening? God, are you still on the throne? God, are you on holiday? Do you know what I'm going through? Can I still trust you? Can I still trust the prophetic dream that you gave me? God, you, you, you must be crazy. You must be... You know, I don't know what Joseph is going through. Can you imagine this young man? Without rhyme and reason, he did nothing wrong. The next thing is a series of misfortune, a series of life threatening events. His own brothers wanted to kill him. Wow. Sold him in the slave market. Wow. And now, it, it just don't understand. I don't know. Most people would have given up. Most people would have given up hope. Most people would not trust Jesus anymore. Most people would have left the church bitter, sore, that's explain why the pandemic the last two years. Maybe God didn't answer your prayer. And many have left the church, backslided. Many, you know, do you still trust God? You see, it's easy to trust God in good times. How about trusting God in bad times? Now, what happened to Joseph? He told the cupbearer, he said, hey, get me out lah, tell Pharaoh lah, Tolo, get me out, I'm innocent. So what happened? The cabara forgot him. You see, when you put your trust in man, you will be disappointed. Man is not your deliverer. Man is not, the doctor is not your healer. Doctor treats, but God heals. You trust God completely. You trust God for finance. You trust God for provision. You trust God for open doors. You trust God for the visa to be approved. You trust God. Guess what? The Bible says in Genesis 41.1, Pharaoh had a dream two years later. Say two years later. Timing. Sometimes it's a timing. The door may be closed right now, but it's a timing. God will open the door. So two years later, Pharaoh had a dream. Nobody could interpret. The cabara remembered Joseph. You know the rest of the story. Joseph was promoted from prison to palace. Joseph, I believe he trusted God. He trusts God. He don't understand why he has to go to the pit why he has to serve in Potipa's house? Why he has to meet Mrs. Potipa? Why he has to land in prison? But I believe his trust is in the Lord. And those who trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion. Psalms 1 to 5 verse 1, which cannot be removed, which cannot be moved. Psalms 1 to 5 verse 1 says, those who trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. And as you put your trust in the Lord, you'll not be ashamed, you'll not be disappointed. That's my experience for 43 years of walking with Jesus. Let me share a couple of my personal life. When I first graduated from University of Malaya, I was applying for a job. I had a friend who attends the same church in Kuala Lumpur. We attended the same university, attended the same course, graduated the same time. So both of us, went for this interview, we applied for this bank job. He was my good friend. So we applied for this bank job and both of us went for interview. Guess what? My friend got it and I was rejected. I said, how come? I'm some more Chinese and he's a non-Chinese. I said, how come? And this, this, this bank is run basically by Chinese. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not racial, okay? I'm just telling you the facts. I felt very rejected. I felt the door was closed and slammed on my face. Hey, what's wrong with me? I'm good in maths. My result is good. I, anyhow, I was disappointed the door was closed. But shortly after that, God opened the door for me to be a lecturer. And I thank God that the door was closed. I thank God I was rejected by the bank. You know why? The grace, the gift of God suits me to be a lecturer, a teacher, not in the bank. I cannot sit in the office from 9 to 5. In fact, I cannot even sit for one hour. I, I, I need to walk around. I love garden. I love nature. I can't stay in a place sitting in office work. I hate office work. So on hindsight, I'm so glad the door was closed. I just trusted God. It opened the door. I became a lecturer. All right. Then, God called me in the full-time ministry. In 87, I left for Australia, studied one year of Bible school. And in a Bible school, I, I like this 
godly lady and she was very gifted. She could sing and she could preach very well. I thought, and of course I like her, I thought, oh, she'll be a perfect wife for me and my ministry. So one day I pluck up my courage and I approach her. I proposed to her, can you imagine? I proposed to her, she had a shock of her life. This Chinese guy from Malaysia, and he's an Australian, a white Australian. And she was shocked. She said, Paul, give me two weeks. Let me pray, let me ask my parents, and I came back to you. Two weeks later, he, she gave me the answer, no. Oh my God, I felt so sorry for her. Well, do I trust God for my future life partner? I don't know who I'm going to get married. But the door was slammed. The door was closed. I felt rejected. Now, all of us will face rejection, but trust God. Guess what? I married Christina. Well, the best thing is she traveled with me for 33 years around the world. We had a miracle son, Asher. So, I, do work. I wouldn't want to say sorry to the girl that said no to me, but God bless you. Anyway, so come back to my story. Sometimes, we, we may be a victim of rejection. Let me give you one example. Leah, Leah and Rachel. You know the story of Jacob? I'm sure you're very familiar with the story of Jacob. Now, Jacob married, worked seven years for Uncle Laban to marry Rachel. So, she got up from the wedding night. The next morning, Jacob saw it wasn't Rachel. It was Leah, the ugly lady, the sister of Rachel. Can you imagine the shock? Now, I'm sure those days they have oil lamp. I'm sure they have some light. How come this, this Jacob so muchacha, so blind? You don't even know who you slept in the bed that night and you got up the wrong woman. By the way, any of you married, you found that the next day your husband was the wrong one, your wife was the wrong one? I'm sure none of you, right? But Jacob, now what is this principle? How could Jacob be so deceived? Very simple. What you sow, you reap. He deceived his father. He deceived his brother. So now, there's a bigger deceiver called Uncle Laban deceive him. So guess what? He worked another seven years and got Rachel. His love from day one is for Rachel, not Leah. Leah feels so unloved, so rejected. But you know, God is so amazing. That's why I say you trust God. Go open the womb of Leah. She had so many children, but Rachel had none. God closed the womb of Rachel. And only after much intercession and prayer of Jacob that God opened the womb of Rachel. Now, I want to show you the lineage, the generation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Who is the next one? You read your Bible? Go back and look at the genealogy in Matthew 1. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Who is the next one on the lineage where Jesus comes, the generation flow? Well, it was Judah. The next one was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. Who is Judah? Judah is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Now, who is the mother? Leah. Say, wow, it wasn't Rachel. Even though Leah was rejected, even though Leah was unloved, God still had a plan for her. So praise God. Maybe you're a victim of rejection. Maybe you're a victim of circumstances. Maybe you're a victim of politics in the, in the company. Rejoice, God has a better plan. I just came back from, from uh, uh, Indonesia at the airport. Uh, a good friend of mine, he's a businessman, picked me up. And we were driving back. He was driving me back home. And he began to share his testimony. He's a wonderful Christian, loves God. And I didn't know some of his stories, but he shared with me a story that he never told me before. He was, when he was young, he was working for um, a very big uh, company in Malaysia. It was a Chinese-owned company. And he was part of the management, very higher ranking. And, and he, was, he performed well. He was the best uh, person there in charge of a certain department. But one day, there was politics in the in office. The, the, the major shareholder, the, the chairman, had a son and, and you know, wanted the son to replace him. And, and through politics and manipulation, he was asked to leave. Of course, you are performing well, you did so well, the company is doing well, and you get fired. You know, it's hard to swallow, right? Now, talk about politics, talk about manipulation. It's everywhere. But as a child of God, I want to encourage you, trust Him. Just trust Him. Well, he didn't understand. Was he hurt? Yes. Was he rejected? Yes. 
Was he feel betrayed? Yes, he gave his life, his potential, his gift to the... And this is what? You just get fired. Wow! Guess what? God opened a business opportunity for him. He lost his job. He entered into business. A friend of his looked for him to be a partner. And, and, and they joined together and started a business. Today, he owned three big companies international company dealing with international products and he's doing so so well he's doing far more and he's a boss and he can take off anytime he can go anytime you see sometimes we don't understand tomorrow and the next day we just see what is past and present that's where we need to trust god that's where i come to my third point so point number one trust god when you don't understand whatever you're going through Trust God. Point two, when the doors are closed, when you feel rejection, maybe the timing is not right. The visa is rejected. The work is rejected. You apply for something is rejected. You propose to someone is rejected. Or halfway through, the girl leaves you and you're hurt. Or the boy leaves you, you know, just before you get married and you broke off. You know, of course it's hurting. Of course it's reject. But trust God. I want to encourage you. Trust God. God is in control of your life, if you believe. And He is your Heavenly Father. Not just your God, but your Abba Father. Point number three, the third situation you need to trust God is the uncertainty of our future. Now, Jesus is Alpha and Omega. He knows A to Z about our life. In Psalms 139 verse 16, a powerful psalm. I encourage you to read Psalms 139. You know, uh, when you go back home or after you listen to this recording. Psalms 139 is a revelation. Uh, Psalms written by David. David says, God, you're everywhere. You're omnipresent. You're omnipresent. You're omnipotent. You, you're omniscient. You know everything. You hear everything. You know the future. And you're the most powerful person. Now, how can it be wrong to trust a person like this? He says, no matter where I go, you are there. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, you already knew me. Jeremiah 1.9, God says to Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you and appointed you to be the prophet to the nations. Wow, that's our God. He has written the name in the palm of your hand. He knows the number of hairs that drop every day and you still know the numbers of your hair on the head. That's what God knows everything. That's why you can trust Him, your future. He knows your past, your present. He also knows your future. To God, there is no past, present, future. To God, it's just one linear line. He sees A to Z in one go. Now, you can trust God. Now, Joseph, he didn't know that he's going to be in the palace, right? I'm, I believe Joseph trusted God. So, trust God for your future. In Psalms 139 verse 16, David says, all the days of my life are written in the book. Verse 16, while wow. all the days in my life are crafted in your hand. God crafts every day of our life. Wow, a time to be born, a time to die. A time to minister in Indonesia, a time to minister in Spain or UK. I mention this because next week we are going to UK and then to Spain. Again, God opened amazing doors for our ministry. You know, I just went to buy breakfast this morning and I met this ex-businessman, a very successful businessman. I think he's probably about 80 years old. I was talking to him. I asked him, what's your age? He was very reluctant. Of course, he's a non-Christian. So I quickly shared a quick gospel to him. I said, hey, look, you know, your life is already pointed when to be born, when to die. There's nothing superstitious about telling your age. I can tell you my age, no problem. I'm not afraid to die. But you see, for a non-Christian, they do not know the future. They don't know where they die. Uh, where would they go? Heaven or hell or in between? So I told him, I said, look, very simple. You make sure you believe Jesus so when you die, you can go to heaven. If you don't believe, you die, you may go to hell where the burning. Now, I know it's hard to swallow, but that's the truth. Maybe today is the last day I saw him. So I took the opportunity to share a quick gospel to him. So uh, what I'm trying to say is trust God for uncertainty. Trust God for your future. Jeremiah 29 is a very powerful scripture. In Jeremiah 29 verse 10, the, the, the people of God were in Babylon. 
they were in captivity for 70 years. And God sent Jeremiah and declared a prophecy. God says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to give you a future and hope. Now, that's ridiculous. You're going through Babylonian captivity. You don't even have a home. You can't even sing and worship God. And suddenly God says, Hey, I got a great plan for you. You're going to go to house you never built. You're going to go to a uh, vineyard and experience the fruits that you never planted. Hey, crazy. Ah. Such God exists, is it? You can trust such God. Now, I'm sure when, when the children of Israel were in the Babylonian captivity and this prophecy came, God knows. God knows the future. God knows tomorrow. Can it happen? Of course it can happen. I want to share with you what it means. God knows. Alright? And I know this sounds very simple. But believe me, God knows. I mentioned just now I was in a Bible school for a year in Australia. Halfway through the Bible school, I had chicken pox. I was down with fever. I was in the room all by myself for a couple of days. And it was horrible. One day, about lunchtime, I suddenly had a crave for Chinese fried rice. Now, I was in Brisbane, Australia. The last six months, I've been eating Aussie food, potato and bread and fish and chips and, you know, wonderful. But after six months, I was craving for Chinese fried rice. Now, that's year 1987. Nobody knew my situation. I think if I died that day, nobody in Malaysia knew. Anyway, I was all alone and lonely and I was miserable, you know, very miserable. When you fall sick in a foreign land, it's very miserable. So I was craving for Chinese fried. Guess what? An elderly lady came to visit me and she bought me Chinese fried rice. In 87, there's not many Chinese restaurants. Well, there's McDonald's, there's KFC, there's uh, uh, what, chicken, whatever, and there's burger, there's... But Chinese fried rice, even if you go to a Chinese restaurant, there is noodles, there is so many things to buy. There's roast duck, roast pork, and so many things to buy. How come she only bought Chinese fried rice? Does God know what you crave, what you need? Does God know your future? All right, many years ago, I was in Kuching. And I was, uh, that was in the early 80s. I was in Kuching and I stayed in this missionary home. The husband is an uh, Englishman and the wife is from Hong Kong. They had a huge garden and they have this rambutan tree. So it was very short, about maybe eight feet tall and it was yellow color rambutans. And I still remember it was all ripe on the tree. So I asked them, I said, can I, can I just have some? He said, yeah, just help yourself. And I was plucking. Now, I was not even married. I was single. I was not even in a full-time ministry. So while I was eating the rambutan, I just had this desire. I said, Ayah, one day, uh, how nice my garden got rambutan tree. It's just a passing wish. I was single. I was not married. I don't own a house. I was just renting a room. I was working as a lecturer. I was renting a room in PJ. I was thinking, wow. Anyway, I I've forgotten. That was in the 80s. Long, long time. You know, today I'm staying in a house and I have a very big garden. And I, I had two rambutan trees, one red color, one yellow color. And every year, two seasons, there'll be lots of fruits, yellow rambutan and red rambutan. One day, I, I just evening, I just went to the balcony. It was very stuffy and hot. I just wanted some fresh air. Then in my balcony there, I could see uh, distance away, the mountains, the green. I, I just love nature. So when I went there, of course, I looked down on the garden and I, I saw the two rambutan trees. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit reminded me, do you remember in Kuching, in that garden, so many years ago, so many years ago, you had a desire or a modern tree in the garden. You had a desire to have a big garden. See, I've granted your desire. I cried when the Spirit of God spoke to me. Why? I've forgotten totally. I've forgotten. I didn't even pray. I just wish. I just wish. See, God knows. You know, Joseph in the Bible, in Matthew 1, she heard news that Mary was pregnant. 
and they have not consummated the marriage. They, they were married, but they have not come together. They have not had intimacy yet. So when Joseph heard the news, the wife is pregnant, how can it be? So my wife is playing around with some man, isn't it? So at night, he couldn't sleep when he got the news. The Bible said as he was thinking how to put Mary away without shaming her, without publicly exposing her. She was thinking how to get rid of her, how, how to you know, divorce her, something like that. The Bible said as he was thinking, God sent an angel. Joseph, the child that is pregnant in Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Wow, I was thinking, while he was thinking, God already knew. God already knew before he was thinking. And while he was thinking, God sent an angel and answered him. That's the God we serve. We do not know the unknown, but we know the known God. You know, may I suggest you just put your hand in God's hand. Trust Him when you go through a difficult time. Trust Him in the unknown. Trust Him in the things that have happened in your life. We all need to trust God. Believe me, there will be storms that come into our life. There will be situations that we don't understand. I like an Indonesian song. It says, Banyak perkara yang ku tidak mengerti Mengapakah harus terjadi In other words, he says, there's a lot of things that happen in my life I don't understand. And then the chorus says, Tuhan peduli, Tuhan mengerti segala persoalan yang ku hadapi. Wow, that's so comforting. God knows, God understands. Believe me, God knows, God understands. And you can trust Him. You can trust Him even though you are the victim of circumstances and you don't understand the future let me tell you two stories as i close the first story is found in the bible uh Bathsheba, the story of a Bathsheba. now in second samuel 11 it says in the year when king goes to battle david remained in jerusalem david now is a king and is established and this this Bathsheba had a husband called uriah he's a soldier in the army and they were in the war in a year, in the springtime where, where kings goes to battle. There was a war going on. David sent Joab and all the mighty men there too. But he himself stayed in palace. You see, when you miss God's time, when you feel there's nothing more to do, you become restless. So I'm sure he got up from the nap one afternoon, was restless, and looking down from his balcony and saw a woman taking a bath. You know why her name is called Bathsheba? Because she likes to take bath. So, you know the rest of the story. David lasted after her, slept with her. And then Bathsheba conceived. So Bathsheba sent news to David. Hey, I got a baby. So to cover up his sin, King David had Uriah come back, give food and ask him to go and sleep with the wife to cover up. Because, you know, babies born, huh? actually they all look alike. Just in case. Unless you have a DNA test, you don't really know who's the father and mother, actually. They all look alike. Anyway, only when they grow up big, then all the features will turn up who resemble who. But when they are babies, you don't know. So to cover up his sin, David was a great chess player and, and he moved his moves, he moved his pieces carefully. And of course, Joab says, hey, how can I come back and enjoy my wife where my brothers are fighting in the battlefield? I cannot. So he slept outside. So David said, okay, he sent a letter to Uriah, give it to Joab, ask Joab to put him on the front line, pull out the troop and let him be murdered. So wicked. Sometimes when I read the story of David, it's so hard to understand. A man that is so noble, a man who is after God's heart. Okay, he has a weakness, a woman, and now he committed cold-blooded murder. Wow. Wow. Before you judge him, all of us have areas in our lives that needs to be redeemed, that needs the grace of God. We all have weaknesses. We are all sinners saved by grace. So cast a first stone if you don't have sin. Anyhow, my focus is not on David. My focus is not on Uriah the Hittite. My focus is on Bathsheba. Bathsheba was a victim of authority, victim of circumstances. She did nothing wrong. She was just under the hand of somebody authority the king she could not do anything 
Now, she goes through the, the trauma, the loss, the grief. He, he carried the baby for nine months. Did she love the baby? Of course. And then God struck the baby dead. Now, did she deserve that? No, it was David's sin. It was somebody else's sin, but she was reaping the consequences of somebody else's sin. They call it collateral damage. Somebody did wrong, we suffered. That's why you need to pray for authorities. When the government, when those authorities make wrong decisions, we all suffered. Anyway, so here was Bathsheba. Can she trust God? Can she trust the Jehovah God? God, why did you allow? Can I still worship you? Can I still believe you? And after all, David is a worshiper. He's a priest, a prophet and king. And yet he did such horrible things. Can you choose trust God? I, I cannot answer for her, but I hope she did. But do you know what God did? God knows. Guess what? God knows her future. The next time she conceived, of course, David took her as wife. The next time she conceived, she bore Solomon. And Solomon became the next king that replaced King David. For all Bathsheba, I want to speak to you right now. God will give you a Solomon. All right, I forgot to tell you the Leah story. Do you know who, whose son was, uh, who was the mother of Judah? It was Leah, not, not Rachel. Judah was the lineage that followed. Judah means praise. Out of the rejection and closed door and all the disappointment, may you have praise birth into your heart, into your mouth. May you still praise God and worship God when you are rejected, the door are closed, or you're a victim of circumstances. Maybe God has a Judah waiting for you. Maybe God has a Solomon waiting for you. Rejoice! Just trust God completely. And finally, I share with you a personal testimony and I'll close. You know, many years ago, we just got married and it's about two years in a marriage. That was probably in 92. I was honoured, privileged to be chosen as a candidate for dengue fever. And not only dengue fever, the worst kind, the category of dengue fever, mine was the worst kind. I landed in the best hospital in the world, Kuala Lumpur General Hospital hospital in the third ward. Now, this is the year 1992. The bed was so close to the road. The next to it is the road and the fan is like World War II fan. You know, it's so old, it's so noisy. I, I was looking at the fan up there. Well, at night, I'm thinking if I don't die of dengue, I'll probably die of this fan drop down and hit me. Anyhow, to make the short story long, <laughs> I was hospital with dengue fever and my skin was like Reptile skin was horrible. Dengue fever from the pits of hell. Every morning, the doctor would come. Every evening, one doctor would come and, and you know, ask me a standard question. Are you bleeding? Every morning, they would come and take my blood. I was on drips and you know, high fever. I was skin and bone. And On the third morning, I went to the toilet and I was bleeding. I was shocked. I saw blood. I knew this is bad news. You see, dengue fever attacks the platelet count in your blood. The, the platelet in your blood prevents you from bleeding. So when the platelet count in your blood drops to very low, you start bleeding through your nose, your eyes, your anus, and you die. And there's no medical cure. There is no medicine. Your immune system got to fight it out. And if your immune system is not strong, you die. So on the third morning, the doctor came to see me, not one doctor, four doctors. While they examined me a long time, they had a mini seminar. And they saw Christina, we were just standing nearby watching the whole thing. And one doctor went to her and told her, get ready for the worst. Isn't that exciting? When the doctor says, get ready for the worst. By the way, doctor don't decide when you die. God is written a day you're born. A day you die. So doesn't matter what the police report, sorry, not police report, what the doctor's report say. I think a lot of people have been scammed. So I'm talking about, we're talking about scam this morning with my wife. So talk about police report. Anyway, medical report do not decide you live or you die. Okay, so trust God. So I knew I was dying. Isn't it exciting? Anybody died before? You know you'll be dying. So that night I couldn't sleep. Isn't it exciting? I was just married for two years. 
and my, we didn't have any children yet. So I was lying in bed that night and I could not sleep. Isn't that exciting? You couldn't sleep. I was thinking, what the future hold? I'm going to leave a widow behind. I just started ministry for a few years and God has tremendous prophecy and promise. I'm so young. 92, I'm only 31. I'm not even 31. 30, because my birthday was December. Well, at night, I couldn't sleep. So I'm thinking, ah, maybe Jesus is going to come and heal me tonight. Don't only heal me, bring the healing power to the nation. Then I'll become evangelist with a healing gift. Maybe that's God's will. So I waited, waited, Jesus didn't come. Then I said, Jesus, maybe in my case it's not so serious. Just send an angel. Just send an angel and bring me the healing. I waited, waited. Nothing happened. I fell asleep, like half sleep. Suddenly I heard footsteps. So I kind of opened my eyes and saw this white figure come. Ah, must be an angel. At last it was the nurse. The nurse came and checked on me. So nothing happened. I went back to sleep. And that night I saw a dream in a sleep, very strange dream. I saw this huge clock, so huge, in front of me. It was at 11.59 and the small second hand was just left the 12th mark. So the second hand started moving. And I just knew when the second hand hits 12, I'll be totally healed. I cannot explain. I'm just telling you the dream I had, the details I'm telling you. So I was watching. I was looking at this clock in front of me. And as it ticks and hit 12, I scream, I'm healed, I'm healed. I got up, you know. I was in a hospital bed, the drips, everything. The next morning, they come and take the blood test. I knew my blood palate count would come back to normal. And guess what? In the evening when the result came out, my blood count was back to normal. My fever left. I was totally healed. The next day, I was discharged. Hallelujah. Psalms 31, verse 15. When David was in a threat of death and survival, he says in Psalms 31, My hope, my trust is in you. My times are in your hand. I want to encourage you, my dear brother, sister. Psalms 31, 15. Trust God. Your hope, your future is in God. Your times are in God's hand. Your future is in God's hand. Your prosperity is in God's hand. Your open door is in God's hand. Your healing is in God's hand. The welfare of your children and your future is in God's hand. Just trust Him. Whoever trusts in the Lord will not be disappointed. Whoever trusts in the Lord will not be ashamed. Those who trust in the Lord have His mouth Zion, which cannot be moved. And as you put your trust in the Lord, you will not You'll not be anxious when the drought comes. You'll not be fearful when things go wrong. And you shall continue to bear fruit the rest of your life. Just simply, just trust in Him. Amen. Let me just pray for you as I close. Father, I just pray for everyone who hear this recording. Lord, may they be encouraged. Even though they go through difficult times, even though they go to circumstances they don't understand, even though they go to life-threatening situation, or sickness, or cancer, or a child that is backslided, or something uh, <clears throat> like a couple I shared that the daughter married a Muslim. God, we can trust you. And we know that it causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him, to those who are called according to your purpose. Lord, touch everyone, bless everyone. May they continue to trust you more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.